We'll get our meeting called to order. I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, we had a really fun opportunity earlier this evening to have a reception for our PTO leadership in the district. Like many of you know, we have 15 schools in our district, each of which have their own parent-teacher organization, and we're very appreciative for those individuals who are able to give back to allow our PTOs to flourish and for the neat academic and social and just all sorts of fabulous ways that they enhance our school district and the um, education that each of our students receive. We would also like to welcome our athletic and our academic scholars this evening. We're pretty excited that we have some special presentations for you. And with that, we'll go with our roll call. All, bo <coughs> all board members are present this evening. Thank you. If you'd please rise, we will start have the Pledge of Allegiance. If you direct your attention to the podium, Dr. Wall has a very special presentation. I'd like to invite uh, Rachel Cole to the podium, please, Director of Guidance at Carmel High School. Very special presentation as we recognize our perfect ACT scores from Carmel High School. Rachel, thanks for being here tonight. Okay, thank you. We have nine students who made a, a 36 score, which is the highest score you can make on the ACT, and uh, we're going to take time to recognize them tonight. I just want to say your name, if you wouldn't mind to come up. Uh, David Anderson, or Anderson David. I, I, I said I wasn't going to do that, and I did. Anderson David. Brent DeVries. Sydney Holtapple. Austin Lynch. Peter Megan Hart, Nikhil Raghu Raman, Justin Wren. Pranav Shiram and William Tippins. And we also, just so you know, we uh, gathered this group together and uh, basically said, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, to try to help some of our uh, other Carmel High Schools and it had a, a, a really nice uh, discussion with them. Um, they were all open and sharing, but um, a lot of pra practice tests, I believe, was what we got out of most of that and timing their, their testing. But I really appreciated that they took the time out of an SRT last spring to come and talk with us and share that as well. So really proud of these, of these students.
And students, I do want to mention there are plenty of sweet treats in the back. So before you leave, please grab some of those. I'd like to invite. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, excuse me. I'd like to invite uh, Jim and Skeep to the podium, Director of Athletics at Carmel High School. Very important and very special spotlight on excellence as we recognize the Carmel High School girls and boys swim teams. Jimmy? Chris and I were hoping we were a continuation of the perfect ACT scores, <laughs> <laughs> but we have had my uh, transcripts up here before. We know that is not <laughs> accurate. So it is my honor and privilege to uh, present the 2017 National Champion Boys and Girls Swimming and Diving Programs. And we have some individuals representing those programs that we'd like to have come forward as I make some remarks about um, another incredible season for both of these uh, teams. Come on, guys. Many times we have had the opportunity to introduce state championship teams to the board, and these are very special occasions. This combined national championship is only the second for a public school, and that occurred in 1986. Swimming World Magazine awards the title of national champion after putting state meet times into a dual meet format for all schools throughout the country. After all times were calculated, the Hounds were named the public school national champions. This is the fifth time in a row for the girls program and the eighth time in nine years they have been named national champions. The girls team has won 31 consecutive state championships in a row, which is a national record for all states and sports. The boys program won their 17th overall state title last winter and their third straight. I could go on and on about the accolades and times that these individuals have, but there are a few things and just a few short snippets here of a sentence that kind of summarize our programs, I think. Um, watching these guys pick up trash in the stands on the deck after the state meet is something that's very special to see that they see the bigger picture of, of what they're doing and how they're serving the people that help support their meets and the championship um, formats that go on. Um, watching the tradition of them shaking hands with all of their coaches as they exit practice every day, something that speaks volumes about the type of young men and women that are being raised in our uh, households and also the commitment of our parents, which is an unwavering support and uh, just a willingness to do anything that's asked by our coaching staff, and we very much appreciate it. It is the total package and, and very much the envy of many programs throughout the country. This time I'd like to introduce Chris Plum, who's the head coach, to say a few words about these special individuals and our programs. Uh, thank you for having us, and we're honored to be here, certainly humbled. Um, Obviously, none of this happens without the tremendous just environment which is created by our school district, and particularly Jimmy, uh, his unwavering support is appreciated for all the athletic teams, but we especially uh, appreciate that in the swimming pool, and uh, I know there's not a whole lot of athletic directors that are willing to come down on the pool deck and, and say hello every now and then, so we appreciate that. Uh, we have four seniors here um, who represented us with class last year, and I know we'll lead the way this year. No pressure, guys. Um, <laughs> but um, over here on my far left, we have Andrew Kushan, who's still deciding on where to go to school. <laughs> He's got it down to two, but I, I'll, I'll keep it there. Grace, can I say it, or should we keep it? OK. <laughs> Grace Essebrook is um, looking to attend Penn next year. And then we have two orange schools. It's Drew Kibler, who will be attending the University of Texas next year. And Trudy Rothrock will be going to the University of Tennessee. So, so thank you. To grab the cook, don't forget to grab cupcakes.
We will pause momentarily, so if people would like to go home and study or enjoy the nice weather before it turns, um, please feel free. And Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Seeing that we do not have any public participation, we will go straight to consent. May I get a motion on the table to approve consent? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very exciting that in consent we just appointed the next principal of Town Meadow Elementary. Nikki Rash is with us tonight. Nikki, congratulations. I want to highlight that Nikki is a fit for the profile that was developed by stakeholder parents, stakeholder staff members. And again, this was not in the timing of beginning of the year, but what's exciting about Nikki's appointment is she is a fit for that leadership profile. And it's one of those things, hiring is done in a matter that we try to get the best fit. We didn't have that to start the school year. And Nikki reconsidered and wanted to apply for the position, so she did. And I thank Rhonda Turner for being here this evening, too, as support and mentor from Archard Park. Thank you, Rhonda. But a couple things about Nikki, and we'll send out a press release later tonight. Nikki has spent 19 years in education, most re recently serving as assistant principal for Archard Park Elementary. She began her career as a first grade teacher in Fort Wayne Community Schools, served as a kindergarten teacher and instructional coach for Carmel Clay Schools. I really want to thank the parents and the staff for their patience. Their input for the leadership profile is so critical in trying to find that fit. Very confident that Nikki brings a leadership style where she builds relationships, gets to know the staff, gets to know the parents, gets to know the kids. Uh, very visible, engaging leader, and those were very important qualities in the profile. So Nikki, welcome to the leadership team. Congratulations, and we look forward to great things at Town Meadow. Continued great things. And we will transition Kim Barrett out. Kim has done a great job just stepping in to be an interim. Parents have recognized that. Staff have recognized that. So we're going to hand off the baton uh, through October and have a smooth transition so Nikki can get to know the staff, the parents, and the kids through October and allow for there to be a seamless transition as we start the school year. So Nikki, welcome aboard. Congratulations. Pam, just want you to know that's another Orchard Park person. <laughs> well, you know, can't let it go. <laughs> Congratulations, Nikki. At this particular time, I'm going to suspend a regular board meeting to open a hearing to allow for public input regarding the proposed 2018 budgets, the three-year capital projects plan fund, and the 12-year bus replacement fund. And so that would be at 7.15. Um, on August 28th, Mr. McMichael presented the proposed 2018 budgets, the three-year capital projects fund plan, and the 12-year bus replacement plan. The board discussed these proposals and authorized the administration to advertise for a public hearing at that time. Mr. McMichael, would you like to make any comments regarding these proposals before we invite members of the public to share comments? No, just as you said, this is the opportunity for any public uh, input that there might be for the board to consider. Thank you. And we'll just wait a few seconds if anybody comes. <coughs> do, do, do. So, if anybody has any comments they'd like to share, the floor is open. Okay. Seeing that there are no public comments, we will close the hearing. And we'll resume our regular business meeting. First plan, or first action we have are change orders for the 2017 finishes and renovations at the Carmel High School. Mr. McMichael. Thank you. These um, change orders um, 
there are three of them, and they they total uh, their a total ad change order of thirty one thousand seven hundred and thirty five dollars. Uh, the board can see from the report that um, um, there's actually one deduct change order, and then which closes out of uh, that contractor, and then uh, two other ad change orders. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. May I get a motion on the table to approve the the overall addition and the ten thousand dollars saving deduction? So moved. Second. Second. Mike, we'll give it to Mike. <laughs> Discussion. Um, yeah, what is our contingency at this time for these funds? Do we know? I mean, are we anywhere near money money that we have left over? Um, well, we're not finished with the projects yet. So we we uh, um, we did a number of finishes this summer, but we the uh, budget that we have uh, was exceeded the amount of time that we had to do the work in the summer so uh, we'll continue to do this work next spring and summer okay any other questions thank you and we'll go ahead and vote all those in favor of the 2017 finishes and refinishing renovations at Carmel High School signify by saying aye aye, aye. thank you next on the agenda we have the change orders for the drain improvement project at the high school Yes, and this project is uh, this is a DDEC change order in the amount of twenty thousand um, dollars, and it's closing out the project. This was the unused uh, contingency allowance for that project. Thank you, Mr. McMichael. May I get a motion on the table to approve the twenty thousand dollars savings? So moved. Second. Second. Discussion. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have our course changes for 2018-19, and for that, we turn to Dr. Dudley. Thank you. Um, this evening for discussion, I bring you um, some course changes from Carmel High School for the 2018-19 school year. Um, it's very exciting as we um, go through the courses. We have several new courses proposed. Uh, one is on um, community service where students can receive credit um, where they man a tech help desk for both students and for teachers, which will really help with our technology um, and the students will get that hands-on experience. Um, another one is a robotics and design um, innovation course where the students will have the opportunity that are interested in that engineering and design to have the opportunity to take um, a course such as this. Um, we also are expanding our culinary arts program where they're looking at a course for hospitality management. So they're looking at the other side of um, the hotel. You know, right now we have the culinary with the restaurant piece, but the other side of the house with the hotel, we have many students that are interested in that. And so they're adding that course. Um, we have several elective courses in social studies that um, we are proposing. Um, two are mandated by state law. Ethnic studies and Indiana studies are two elective courses that we are mandated through the past um, legislative session. And then the, up, the other course, African studies, is a course that um, we had interest from students um, and staff to add that course as an elective course. Um, also, we're looking at adding a career exploration internship where students, juniors, and seniors would receive um, credit for internships in their junior and senior year. And then we have some course modifications and deletions. Thank you, Dr. Dudley. I open the floor to discussion. Questions? Pam. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, I, I see where debate and speech are being deleted. Are we replacing that with anything so that the students still get the opportunity to learn those um, skills, mm -hmm. or um, is this just being deleted? No. Um, it's being deleted because we had, um, in the last several years, we've had very few students, like one to two students, actually um, sign up for the course. And one of the reasons for that is several years ago, you may recall, we added an ACP speech class for their senior year where the students take, it's an ACP class, so they get actually Indiana University credit for their speech credit. And so many of our students are taking that, and so we have the very low numbers in these two elective courses. Yes, Lynn. Uh, I have two questions here. So I see uh, a couple of courses here are required, are added because of the requirement from the state. 
and some are deleted due to low enrollment. What are other reasons for adding or removing courses such like such as like last week, I mean last meeting we had a science program evaluation. So would typically program evaluation lead to a change changes in curriculum, like removing or adding courses? Um, possibly a program evaluation could be a reason. For example, when we did our um, program evaluation in our middle school and we looked at the need to have a additional STEM courses. Mm -hmm. We added those courses and we added STEM and then this year um, we'll bring Project Lead the Way, the Gateway program in through eighth grade, which we did add three years ago, but we wanted to phase it in. Um, so it could be a program evaluation. It could be, um, and like the African Studies, is there may be interest from students mm -hmm. and from teachers to add the course. Um, also looking at courses where um, students are interested in, like for the example, the innovation course. We have students that that's a continuation where we have a very strong robotics club at the high school as an extracurricular, but as students um, looking at those additional courses, um, that interest to um, put that into the um, student day. Mm -hmm. um, the state also will um, add courses to the course catalog through the state, and then we'll look at those to say, you know, do we have student interest in those different courses? So there's a variety of reasons of adding courses. And typically when we delete courses, it's because of low enrollment or low student interest in those courses. Uh, I have another question, if you don't mind. Um, how are the course changes here affecting our budget? So like when you add, say, hospitality management, the second course, do we have existing faculty resources to cover that? Yes, because when we go and we look at the staffing piece, um, whenever we there are new courses proposed by de the departments at the high school, there's a whole um, curriculum advisory committee that is made up of um, teachers, parents, students, um, administrators, and so the department um, would propose that course, and then they would look at. Um, several different things. One is who is eligible to teach it, so what's the teaching license required. And so for like the culinary arts, that is um, taught in the family consumer science department. And so that will be existing faculty that would have a section of that course or what have you, and so they may not have a section of a, a different course. It depends on, it, it's all based, the staffing's all based on the student course requests um, that we, they do they actually starting very soon in November <laughs> they start their course request and then in the spring we do the whole staffing and so but it's all within the existing staffing and they the staffing change is based on student course requests thank you mm -hmm. Amy I've got a couple questions for you the first I noticed the capstone seminar and research are now moving down to sophomore junior mm -hmm. options is this because there's a yet another class they can take as a senior that's in the AP Capstone programming, or is it just opening up their schedule to take other classes? Mm -hmm. It's it's opening up their schedule. There's not another, the Capstone research would be the, the last course, but they did open it up because we had interest from students. Many of our students want to take the W131 um, classes at, through their senior year, and so they'll do both the capstone and then those other courses and so that's why it's just moving it down for those students that might be interested in that and then that seminar course counts for your English 10 um, or do you have to take seminar no the seminar course 10? would count for the English 10 okay mm -hmm. second question the IB physics it says it's changed from a one-year course mm -hmm. to a two-year course so how does that, how do you stretch that out? Is it the same material and they're just digging deeper or what? what? No, they, uh, many of our IB courses can be either taught as a one-year course or a two-year course. And so it would be an additional year of curriculum. And so they would, instead of receiving the two credits that they would receive in a one-year course, one for each semester, they would receive the four credits for that. Um, but it's additional material in the IB courses. But the AP psychology is not. That was in one semester, and most of the high schools teach the AP psychology in a full year. And they said this would be much better for our students to have that in a full year. That's not additional material, but the IB is. Okay, so with that IB physics, will students, they're required, I'm assuming, then to take it for two years. It's their building? Not necessarily. They, take it for a single year? they could take it for a single year and not take the second year. Sometimes okay. they'll take the. Um, 
standard level, which is the IB standard level, which they're offering here, and then they may move into the um, IB HL, which is the higher level. I see. Or they could do the two years of the SL. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Pam. Yes. On the um, career uh, exploration, um, is that uh, incorporated into the voc vocational uh, ed that uh, are we offering any um, internships for vocational kids? I mean, kids who are going into uh, building trades or um, auto um, this this one is not through that this one this is through our um, special services department and so these are for our students that are doing um, internships their junior and senior year they will allow them to earn credit for those internships so they work with a job coach and so they'll work in the community at different businesses and then this will allow them to um, receive that the um, we are looking at possibilities of more partnerships with Ivy Tech okay. in the areas in the voc ed areas. Okay. Um, but that's one that we're still um, looking at and exploring. Yeah, because that would be kids that are career ready, but not necessarily college. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Great questions. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Dudley. And then we will look forward to bringing that back for approval in October. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have reports, and the first is our student assessment, and for that, we turn to Dr. Dudley as well. So this evening, I <coughs> wanted to share with you um, some different assessments that we look at, and this is looking at um, a very um, bird's eye view. We're looking at all of our students that take these assessments. And this first graph is looking at our um, students' um, achievement, their growth in math. And this is measured on our math map growth assessment. Um, sometimes it's better known as NWEA. The actual test is called map growth. Um, but most people know it by NWEA. Um, so this is our students looking over a three-year period because as you'll recall we started um, with MAP testing in our elementary schools back in 2014-15 school year. So this is looking at our students um, as when they started that first blue line is our students when they were kindergartners and then as they moved into first grade. So it's looking at a year's growth from fall to fall. So fall of their kindergarten year to fall of their first grade year. So it's, it's also taking into account um, that summer as well. But as you can see, over the last three years from 2014 to 2017, in each of our grade levels from kindergarten to first, first to second, second to third, we can see our students are making um, good some um, very good significant growth like in kindergarten. Um, <clears throat> Also looking down at fourth to fifth grade, um, fifth to sixth, sixth to seventh, and seventh to eighth grade, we see, we're see we seeing some significant growth um, in those areas uh, with those groups of students. And so each bar is a different group of students, but it is looking at their year growth. And when we look programmatically, we look, we look at it from this angle, so not looking at um, exact cohorts of growth. So this is our map growth. And then the next one is our reading um, map growth. So this is also looking at our students, the same piece from when they were kindergarten students into first grade. Um, and you can see in kindergarten we're seeing some very good growth in fifth to sixth, sixth to seventh, and seventh to eighth. Um, in our first to second, second to third, third to fourth, we're seeing a, a bit of a decline this past year. So really looking at it programmatically, what are the pieces, why might that be happening? And um, digging into that, are there different um, instructional strategies that we need to look at? Because again, the way we're looking at it from this view is looking at it programmatically. So what are those pieces that we need to maybe go in and tune up um, in those areas in the areas of reading? So this next slide, this is um, changing assessments, and this is looking at our I-STEP assessment. And as you'll um, recall from previous um, 
presentations. I-STEP is a very different type of assessment than the MAP growth assessment. I-STEP is a criterion reference, so basically what it's looking at, it's a um, summative assessment that is um, measuring the student's progress, the student's achievement, measured against the standards. Um, and it is a one, one assessment, it's a summative assessment, and it's not looking um, at the student's growth. So this is looking at it in a very um, bird's eye view where um, the first several graphs, this is comparing um, Carmel Clay's um, achievement against the states. So we first have the English language arts, all of our students in third through eighth grade, and you can see um, uh, Carmel Clay's um, achievement very much outshines um, where we are with the state. Um, our achievement is fairly um, stable over those three years. And then in 10th grade for both <coughs> English language arts and math, we only have two years of data because the test changed and we only have the two years. Um, but you can see um, in the area, and we'll show, I'll show another graphic um, later on with our math, but when we're looking at the math in our 10th grade, that is an area that we're looking at. Not, it's not just as we're looking at 10th grade, but we're looking more programmatically over what does our math instruction look like. Um, as we an area that we do need to improve upon. So this is drilling it down um, even even further. So this is looking at I step again. This is the same assessment over a three year period, and this is three years of the same assessment. As you'll recall, three years ago the state changed the assessment, and um, it was based on the new Indiana academic standards that were also based on the Common Core standards, which were much more rigorous than the previous standards. And so the test changed, and the test did become um, more difficult. Um, and, but this is three years of looking, um, testing it against those same standards. Um, and as you can see, we have, as, if you look at fifth grade here in um, English language arts, we do have some significant um, achievement in the pass plus. That dark green is the pass plus where we have 50% of our fifth graders um, scored at a pass plus. And our students that did not pass, that significantly reduced. Um, from 13.7 to 11 percent. Um, so we did see some changes. And then also in third grade and fourth grade, you can see that our pass plus did increase, um, especially in fourth grade, we did see some significant increase in that pass plus area in, in English language arts for ISTEP, which is always a positive that we want to see. We would like to see the did not pass. We want to see those decrease. Um, we don't see significant decreases um, in those areas, but that's, we're continuing to um, look at that and work on that. But seeing them in the pass plus area too, we want to see our students move into that. So this is our um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade English language arts again. And again, you can see in our sixth grade, um, some significant growth from 39.6% in pass plus to 50.8% in pass plus in sixth grade. Um, from one year to the next and some significant decrease in the did not pass, which is a very positive sign that we want to see. And then the other two pass plus areas as well, we see um, some increase in that area. So we'll continue to um, measure those and look at that from a programmatic standpoint. So as we look at math in our um, I stepped in third, fourth, and fifth grade. Again, we can see some significant um, pass plus in our fourth grade, um, as well as not so much significant pass plus, but a significant decrease in our fifth grade and did not pass in math, which is a positive sign as well. Um, our third grade, we saw actually an increase by about three percentage, a little bit under three percentage in our did not pass. And so that's an area as we're looking at different groups of kids, but as we're looking programmatically, what are those pieces that we need to shore up there so that they're going in the other direction. And then in our math in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, uh, we are seeing some significant gains again in the um, pass plus in sixth grade. Um, in Seventh and eighth grade, we see some shifts in the other directions. Um, but looking at that seventh grade math, those past two years looking at the did not pass, that is an area that we definitely need to dig into and look at what's happening that we need to shore up as well in those math areas that are looking at those did not pass areas. And then also in our eighth grade, we had a significant shift in the did not pass as well. 
And then in 10th grade, as you can see, um, 10th grade I-STEP is um, we have our English language arts, which is our scores are about the same. But again, especially in the areas of math, that's an area that we're looking programmatically all the way through in our math instruction to shore up, not just at the high school, but in our middle schools and also in our elementary schools to improve those scores as well. So questions that you might have. Well, I do have one to begin. Um, first, thank you for bringing this to us. And, and I'm glad we recognize there are some gaps and <coughs> that we are in the process of identifying what those gaps are so we can move in the right direction. Um, at one point, when we were offering remediation for those who did not pass, we made it a point to capture those who almost did not pass. Do we, are we continuing to do that? Yes. Um, we do a variety of different um, pieces. First is looking at um, move, shifting from just the remediation to the intervention. So catching them before they do not pass to kids that may be at risk. One of the pieces that we do have, um, which is a nice piece um, with our MAP growth with our NWEA, they have a very strong predictor <coughs> on, so we can see our students and they have linking studies to I-STEP and you can determine, you can see, okay, is the student at risk at not passing and then you have all year before they take the test in the spring to really shore up those skills and it is a very strong predictor when we go back and look at the um, assessments that they took in um, NWEA and look at the predictor um, predictability, um, that is a strong predictor. So we really want to focus more on the intervention and catch them before they fail. Um, but we also look at, um, in some areas, we look at those students that not only are just a few points on you know passing and closer to the did not pass, but we also look at the other end of this um, scale, those students that are passed that are just a few points away from the pass plus. And so how can we also improve um, their achievement as well and what are the pieces that we need to shore up? So we look at it uh, in all of those different pieces. Thank you. Lynn. That, correct, correct. Um, to, your very, to the very beginning of the presentation, I try to understand what the numbers mean. When we do those mass growth, what does like a 20 or 10 or right. what are these numbers? Those are the average, thank you, good question. I'm sorry I didn't put that on there. That is the average um, RIT growth. So when the students take the NWE assessment, they get a RIT score. And so this is the average um, RIT score growth uh, from comparing year to year. So the kindergarten students into first grade and their growth from kindergarten to first grade or their mm -hmm. growth from first grade to second grade. Um, and so it's the average of all of the students, um, their RIT scores in the okay. percentage and of growth. As, as we can see here, when kids move from kindergarten to first grade, this is where they get the biggest growth, right? Correct much yes. higher than others. Correct. Um, and I know we are talking about NWEA here, but there's also another term, MAP. So is it an official term change, terminology change? No, NWEA is the company, is the nonprofit organization that, that sells MAP. MAP growth is the official name of, of the, test. the assessment itself. Okay. Yes, but um, most people know it by NWEA. But it's MAP growth is actually the official name um, because NWA has several different assessments. Mm -hmm. um, they have MAP Navigator, which looks at um, a progress monitoring assessments. The MAP growth is the assessment that all of our students take kindergarten through eighth grade. I see. Mm -hmm. I also have, have questions about the NWEA report. I compare my daughter's report this year to last year. I noticed some differences, and I tried to understand, tried to find online resources, but it looks like the online, the website hasn't been updated yet with a new format. So I think I can ask you later, maybe just showing you the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you're talking about the, their new, um, their new reports that they have, where it right. shows, yes. It's slightly yeah. different, but the website is still showing the instructions to interpret last year's Last year's report. report. Yes. Okay. Thank yes. you. 
Pam? Yes. I, I just have uh, one question. Um, the MAP scores, these are across the district, correct? Correct. Okay. And I'm assuming we do the same thing per school so that we can look at the growth in the, in the individual schools and figure out what needs to be done in the school itself yes yes this same report and this is this actually comes out of our NWA program and so each school can pull up this report and um, putting it side by side year to year you you have to pull several reports together but you very easily can pull up each year and then look at and so all of our schools um, we dig down and drill down to the data for all of our schools and look for that growth. And then we uh, can look at, at individual schools and figure out which schools may need more Title I help or um, instructional assistance so they can achieve? Well, yes. I mean, we, we look at schools that um, we want to make sure that all of our schools are showing growth. Um, Title One, not Title One, is based on another formula that right. comes through the state mm -hmm. um, formula, and so right now. But we they still three of our offer schools. help for the for the buildings, if money wise. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Katie. I just had a comment. Um, I think, and not maybe every parent or you know even realizes but I had to make a phone call to my child's teacher because they had a significant drop with um, their NWA and she was explaining the amazing resources that these teachers have with these test scores how they can look into behind the scenes to see exactly where a student may need a little extra help and so the information that's sent home to the parents gives us a lot of insight but the <laughs> teachers also have many many resources to see you know where this child is struggling or where actually like the test score came from and so I think that is a really nice resource for our teachers so they can know exactly what to work on and you know what to look at so I just think that just want to make that comment of how there is lots of options with the NWA especially to kind of exact to see where their students are yes yes and the, the learning continuum is a very powerful tool where it can really drill down student by student to determine what are they ready to learn next and where are the pieces where we need to shore up to um, make sure that all of our students are successful. And I'm just going to piggyback on what you had said. <clears throat> I know as a school district, it's very important for us to have some type of a growth model to measure how well our students are doing and how we can, you know, better meet their needs. And as a board, that was had been one of our legislative priorities over the past few years is, is having assessment tools that actually measure growth and not just a stagnant number. So we will continue on that path. So. Any other questions? Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Dudley. Thank that was you. fantastic. We appreciate that. And moving right along to our monthly financial update, we have Roger. Okay, um, our projection, or our actual right now, is, is uh, very close to what we would have anticipated. You'll recall that the last uh, month ago, uh, I noted that our ending balance was higher than um, what it would have been had our 16-17 uh, contract been paid out timely. And so you can see now we're, our balance is um, about 9.2 million, and it's dropped. Um, a little over three million since the last month and, and that's because all the retro pay has been made and that's cleared through the system <clears throat> and the second thing as you know happens um, our, our um, receipts from our, our referendum uh, come primarily when people pay their taxes so as we progress through the year um, we will you know we will not be receiving that revenue so that until you know people pay their taxes in November so it'll go down uh, and somewhere here we'll have a third pay and that will that will drive the balance down as well and then as we um, receive the referendum uh, revenue late in the year um, then you'll see it to start come back up again so we're just pretty much where we would have anticipated we would be at this time of the year thank you Roger mm -hmm. I open up the floor to questions or comments well Roger, you did a fantastic job. <laughs> we have, we have no questions. <laughs> so moving right along, 
we're jumping right into report, actually superintendent's report. So, Dr. Wall. I have nothing to report this evening. Thank you. Board member reports. Mike, I have a question. It's not necessarily a report, but um, on our legislative priorities. We're hoping to bring those to the board next month. Um, I know in the meantime, Dr. Wall was going to look over those with his team. And TIFF came up as a, um, a question, part of a conversation. Um, do you have anything you want to add or do we, that, I, I, that's an area of, I don't know that, that it's so much a priority in our particular district. I think it might be in other districts. And so um, I think I would like some feedback from probably Dr. Wall and our administration on our legislative priorities. Yeah, and, um, I mean, we had uh, Dr. Wall and myself met with Mo Meerhoff, who is the director of One Zone. Um, when we were at the One Zone lunch, she requested that she would like to meet with us, and we were happy to, and we value the relationship we have with the chamber. Um, so we had some input on that. As you uh, may recall, uh, TIF has been um, on ISBA's legislative priority for a number of years. Um, and we have felt because of our relationship that we have with um, the city of Carmel, um, that that was not necessarily one of our priorities. So I have, uh, this year I left it on there, um, and we can talk about it more. Um, I did have a conversation with today, just today with um, Corey Meyer, um, who's the executive director for CRC, Common Redevelopment Commission, and her assistant director. We talked a little bit about it, uh, kind of confirmed um, the same reasons we've not done it in the past. Um, so when we do, I will circulate revised legislative priorities uh, based upon the comments I received before last meeting, um, cleaning them cleaning them up. And I do, um, we can have more discussion about the TIF point, but my thought at this point is that we will remove it um, as one of our priorities. Um, I think as I look at the last draft we had, after I combined um, the numbers that we had before, I was down to seven. Um, and when we take away, um, if we remove the TIF one, we'll be down to six. Um, and the real, most of them are big picture items, nothing for a specific piece of legislation like we've had um, in years past, which I think is sort of consistent with um, the ISBA priorities this year were not as specific as they've been in the past. And part of that might be it's a non-budget year. Um, and I think part of it, and we'll probably hear more at the um, ISBA conference, is maybe a change in who's doing the legislative priorities. And obviously, it's a committee, but the, the leadership has changed there. So um, I will circulate um, the revised legislative priorities. And um, I will leave it up to you if we want to have um, an opportunity for how, how you want to put it on the agenda for discussion and approval um, based upon the time frame that we have between now and the rest of the year. That sounds fantastic. Any other comments or questions or conversations we'd like to have amongst the board? Okay. I'll just make a few announcements. Upcoming meetings and upcoming opportunities. I know we have the Indiana School Board Association's fall conference, so for additional professional development, we'll be attending Monday and Tuesday. I know there's a big um, legislative meeting for Mike as our delegate, and um, there's some other opportunities for the rest of us, so I look forward to that next week. We have fall break, October 13th and 16th. So we've got a nice four-day weekend, so I hope everybody has some time to recoup and regenerate before we kick into a busy season. And um, with that, meeting adjourned. Thank you.